You're listening to Scaling Up Services, where we speak with entrepreneurs, authors, business experts, and thought leaders to give you the knowledge and insights you need to scale your service-based business faster and easier. And now, here is your host, business coach, Bruce Eckfeld. Are you a CEO looking to scale your company faster and easier? Check out Thrive Roundtable. Thrive combines a moderated peer group mastermind, expert one-on-one coaching, access to proven growth tools, and a 24-7 support community. Created by Inc. award-winning CEO and certified scaling up business coach, Bruce Eckfeldt, Thrive will help you grow your business more quickly and with less drama. For details on the program, visit Eckfeldt.com slash thrive. That's E-C-K-F-E-L-D-T dot com slash thrive. Welcome, everyone. This is Scaling Up Services. I'm Bruce Eckfeldt. I'm your host. And our guest today is Craig Overmeyer, and he is a coach, a a fellow Scaling Up coach uh, out of Indiana. I wanted to bring him on the program today, talk a little bit about what's going on in the world. You know, we're facing this COVID-19 situation, crisis, pandemic, depending on how you look at it. And there's been a lot of conversation in the coaching community uh, around how we as coaches, you know, help leaders with not only with their businesses, but really with themselves, with their communities, how they are going to play a part in helping not only deal with the crisis that we're in right now, but also sort of the recovery and the process afterwards of rebuilding and, and processing all this. So I wanted to bring Craig on and talk a little bit about his background. He has uh, some really interesting experience working with law enforcement and helping with crisis, hostage negotiation, death notification. There's a lot of interesting kind of experience and training that I think has put him in a really unique and interesting position to work with his clients and with leaders. And so I wanted to have a conversation about that and just kind of talk about what we're finding is working for folks. And honestly, I think this could apply whether you're CEO of a company, whether you're you know helping your community, whether you're leading your family. I think all these all these things, all these leadership skills are going to apply to just about everyone dealing with the situation. So I hope we can create some interesting conversations, takeaways. With that, Craig, welcome to the program. Yes, hey, thank you, Bruce. Uh, honored to be here. It's an amazing time. This global healthcare crisis is now a business crisis. And uh, so I'm really interested to uh, have a dialogue with you and hopefully everyone can go away with some very specific takeaways. Yeah. Why don't we talk a little bit about, uh, learn a little bit more about you and your yeah. background. I mean, tell us a little bit about how, I mean, I guess kind of how you got into coaching. What were you doing before that? I know you have quite an extensive you know, professional experience, training certifications. I think we're all kind of learning junkies in the coaching world, but I know you've done a lot of work on various aspects of psychology and leadership and business. Give us a little background. Yes, I uh, worked as a pastoral counselor. I have a doctor of ministry, but I primarily worked uh, at St. Vincent Hospital at the Stress Center. And back then I worked with business owners and their families. It was called therapy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, now yeah. it's coach, coaching. So I had an extensive uh, brand here in Indianapolis and also did some uh, work with Indiana State Police, trained by the FBI to do hostage and suicide negotiations. And so a big part of my work was not only working alongside them during these really intense crises, but also doing critical incident stress debriefing for the, the first responders, the police officers themselves, the firemen, et cetera. And so that uh, should give you a little bit of that background. Then in 1999, it was 20 years of that, and it was time to get some new energy. And so I was trained uh, by a local coach in this model called coaching. It was called real-time coaching. And uh, so I have continued to work with my clients then as a, a coach, bringing coaching skills into the manager role and to the senior team role. Uh, and uh, really focused on cultural transformation. In 2007, I got a call from Vern Harnish. He had gone to an EO conference and asked who he should know in Indianapolis. And my name came up and he asked if I would be interested in the Scaling Up community. So since 2007, I've been involved not only as a Scaling Up coach, but also working with the community and offering as much as I can to help develop coaches to impact their clients in a positive way. Yeah, I appreciate you've made a lot of contributions to the coaching community, which I have benefited from having been a coach now for four or five years. And it's uh, one of the reasons I love the scaling up coaching community because it is so generous and and people help each other out quite a bit. So, and and having been on on this podcast today and everything is just an example of that. So I I appreciate that. So why don't we talk a little bit about the current situation and how how you kind of frame it as kind of a type of situation? Because I think one of the things that I've certainly 
noticed uh, being in the New York City area and uh, you know working with a lot of people in this area is while you know New York you know unfortunately has been through 9/11 we've been through Sandy we've had a series of these kind of you know major kind of cataclysmic events this one is a little different in that at some level we're still kind of waiting for it while it's getting bad and it's it's getting worse you know we're it, it's still not at a peak it's kind of this this slow tsunami that's coming which I think is contextually just different in terms of how you kind of have to process it everything else was kind of recovery this is very much about preparing or dealing with the situation give me a sense of how you've seen things kind of play out or how you kind of see it as kind of a quote-unquote crisis situation and what do you see the dynamic that are important to understand. Yeah, so I, I'm learning a lot from Mark Devine, a uh, former Navy SEAL, uh, who's written a book recently called Stare Down the, the Wolf. Mm-hmm. Stare Down the Wolf. And uh, the concept is, is that the, you have to answer the question, what does it take for your team to become, to serve or to commit as an elite team? And so that's what I'm, uh, I'm helping the teams. I have 15 mid-market uh, executive teams and CEOs been communicating a lot with all of them and really remind them this is like a war. It yeah. is, you, you know, it's a warrior mode and uh, that you have to stare down the fear. You have to acknowledge the fear. You can't bypass it, uh, but it requires a mindful presence. And that's really important that the outside world does not dictate that space in our mind that we can own. Even Vic, Victor Frankl, obviously, yeah. uh, who wrote yeah. In Search of you know, Man's Search for Meaning, said there's a space between stimulus and response, and that's where you want to live. So I start with this vertical integration of that. The, most of our business is out horizontal, I would say, metaphorically. But this is time for vertical integration of all that you've learned as a leader. And if you don't have the skill of mindfulness, then the fear wolf, as the Native Americans use it and Mark uses in his book, is a metaphor that you are now not going to be making good decisions. You're going to be reactive. You're not in that space between stimulus and response. And that's where you want to live. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of that. It's an interesting concept, that difference between something that is scary and being scared, you know, kind of experiencing, you know, a fearful situation. And then what is your what is your response and your ability to put, yeah, kind of put that distance or put some space or realize that there is a choice there at some level in terms of how what internal reaction you are going to have or, or allow yourself to be in on that. And I think it's a, that's for me, that's kind of the root of a lot of this stuff is being able to do that. If you can do that, then you have options. If you can't do that, really, you don't have options. You're you're being controlled by the, the situation. And it's hard to, it is something you can learn, but this is a tough time to learn it. So yeah. that's why all my executive leaders are, I've been trained in a, a practice of mindfulness. It's a, one simple way to do it is called box breathing that Mark has shared with thousands of people who now uh, really turn to him for some guidance because he's a warrior. He's been in fire, you know, where there's live fire. And he says, look, folks, it was easier being a SEAL than being in in, uh, business. (laughs) (laughs) And, And he says, we all put our pants on the same. And so the idea here is that Uh, I focus on this and I've written a book called Accelerate Through Conflict. And the the subtitle is The Missing Conversations Before It's Too Late. And the first step is to seize the moment and regain focus. And that's what I'm encouraging everyone to do. So what are you being seized by is my metaphor. Marx is, you know, what is, you know, you've got to stare down this fear, but it seizes us. And so how do we loosen its grip? That requires just an authentic uh, ability to have dialogue with someone. And that's where coaches can come in, where you can just articulate like, oh my God, I am afraid. I had a CEO call me Monday. Mm-hmm. Uh, he mm-hmm. owns a billion dollars worth of apartment buildings. And he has uh, various banks with millions of dollars due and possibly 30, 40% of the, the folks who rent from him won't have yeah, the full yeah. cup. So, so he and I talked and that's why you know, he needed to name that. We needed to look at it. But then when to regain your focus, I suggest that they use critical thinking. So I took him through this conversation of, all right, let's challenge the assumptions. What are you assuming? So we, we talked about the worst case scenario and then, you know, then 80% of that, then 50%, then 20%. I think you think like that as too, you know, too, Bruce. It's yeah. like, let's look at what are we assuming? Because he realized that he was allowing the assumptions to seize him rather than his business mind or this inner sense, even his spiritual self, re- you know, realizing that the things of this world change and go away. And there's this internal, this pure life within us that we need to access during this time. So by the time we finished with our conversations, he had, had challenged his own assumptions. 
we wrote them down. We began to you know plan. What will I do if this, if this, if this is called the if then sequencing. Mm-hmm. So if mm-hmm. this occurs, then I'll do this. But it's hard to do for yourself. That's why this is a time to work with a coach. Yeah, you, yeah. you can't do it. I have a coach who's helping me do it in yeah. my business. <laughs> exactly. Um, and then the idea. So it's really easy to remember. Challenge assumptions. Root out biases. You have a bias for your business, but also people you're working with have a bias for safety, for their family, for their kids, for their child care. So you just kind of sort it out with somebody, then ask questions that draw out new alternatives and then write those down and kind of look at this scenario, if this, then that, and then press for the evidence to support the solutions you have. So by the time we finished with that, he had a plan. I talked to him again on Wednesday with his business partner, and we have we continued the conversation. But uh, that night, I talked to him then Thursday, and he said he slept like a baby. It wasn't just because of my coaching. I don't think <laughs> – I think it was because the, the federal government was going to help with yeah, their yeah. mortgages. <laughs> and there was other help that he hadn't thought about. So anyway, I hope that – makes sense and helps. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think that one of the interesting things, I think this is actually like an NLP trick or something, but I think one of the things that happens with this is once you do kind of lay out, all right, well, what are the different scenarios? What are the probability of these things? What would be my response? And once you start developing these responses and, you know, even if they're bad situations, right, I have to you know, reduce my staff. I'm going to be, you know, I'm going to cut my business now and I'm going to have to let certain things go. I may have to make some really hard decisions. Just writing down the response that you would have and realizing that, okay, well, that's what I would do just reduces a lot of this anxiety and uncertainty because I think that half of what people end up dealing with or struggling with in these situations is just this unknown. And even you I mean, just developing some kind of plan, even if it's a really ugly plan, having a plan in place just starts reducing that uncertainty, reducing that emotional reaction. I now know what I can do. Now I can start thinking about what else could I do? What, what creative solutions could I do around this? Or how could I really start influencing the future, right? How can I start moving us down a better path than other paths on this this planet. And it, it's a, like I said, I think it's a little cir- sort of psychological trick, but I think it just frees up the mind to not have to worry about things as much because now you know what it is and you can start being a little more creative. I'm curious if you've seen that in the, in the groups that you've worked with. Well, yeah, it's the basic idea that you need to name your emotions because yeah. when you name something in your mind, you become an observer. So it's extremely important to observe the news. If you keep analyzing and judging, that's bad news. Well, this is good news. This is bad news. It's just news. And so it's that Zen concept of mindful presence and just observe and make really much better decisions because you're not so gripped by the outside forces. So naming something is the key. And I would say for all all of you who are CEOs, listen deeply and I, here's a concept I it took me years to figure out. Listen to learn, ask to empower. So listen to learn the perceptions, the, the judgments, the biases, the, the traps, the blind spots. But just listen and learn and don't fix anything right away when you're having conversations with your senior team or with your staff. Just listen deeply, more deeply than you've ever listened before. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And ask, ask questions that, that they can begin to understand, you know, just to sort out. And I think then you always ask, we learned this from a guy named Michael ben- Bengay Stanier, that you say then, well, what's the real challenge for you? That's really important. What's the real challenge for you is a, as, is a question that everyone should ask. And then, and what else? And what else? Yeah. And you dig yeah. a little bit more. So that's more of the, the conversational uh, side of it. The other piece that I would recommend is listen to your automatic thoughts. And that's where the judgments and biases are going to, our story is going to be horrible. So you got to write, or we have a bias for it. It's going to be okay. <laughs> you know? yeah. But I think what you're saying, write it down, name it, do that. You know, don't do that alone. Um, and then you begin to, you begin to be less seized by the, uh, the problem on the outside and begin to find your way through it. Yeah. So. And one thing I've certainly found is as CEOs are working with their leadership teams, you know, one of the best things they can do is is just help their teams, help the individuals of their their leadership team go through this process, right? Helping them, coaching them to actually go through the, okay, so what are the issues? What are the assumptions? What are the probabilities? What are the cases that you're worried about? The probabilities of those happening? What are the responses? How would you deal with that? You know, once you can sort of help them unwind this kind of complicated thinking in their head, giving them some insight and some kind of laying it out for them gives them the space to now start thinking of some other alternatives. Well, what else could we do? What are we not thinking of? Are the assumptions really true? Is there a way, is there data we could collect or things we could do that would change the probability of some of this stuff? You know, I think it's one of the best roles you could have as a CEO. Yeah. And also remember the neuro 
physiology of what that is. I, the Neural Leadership Institute, if they're not getting the blog post by David Rock from the Neural Leadership Institute, you should do that. Get off this, stop listening to us and go Google it. <laughs> I'll, put, I'll put it in the show notes so people yeah. can click through. No, really, it. because yeah. it's a real simple idea. Everyone's either in a toward or a threat state. It's just the social conditioning that we've had since we were cavemen and women. Yeah. You, know, you, you go around the bend and is this tribe friendly or kill me, right? Yeah. So there's a real simple model that you could reference, Bruce, that I think could help everyone. That when you're, when you're having these, what I call in the moment conversations before they become crucial, these are moments where you're just seizing the moment to have critical thinking. When you write it down and listen, there's a, an acronym I'd like for everyone just to jot down just for uh, just a brief. I'll share what it means. Yeah. It's easy to remember. SCARF. S-C-A-R-F. So uh, when you're having conversations with your, yourself, with your team, your, your employees, the S stands for status. So what is my status with you and what is my status now with the company? And they're going to be in a tremendous threat state depending on their role in your company. And some may lose their status or there may be, they may be let go. I don't know. But you have to at least acknowledge that that's what their threat is. Their status is being threatened. Second is certainty. Man, talking about we have tremendous uncertainty. Yeah. So then what can you be certain about? What can you offer that you'll do? What help can you get? Will you, is there something you can share with them that gives them some sense of, hey, regardless of the outside, here's, you can be certain that we're going to be thinking and doing this. Here's our core values. Here's, here's how we're going to live as a, as a business or as, a, as humans helping each other in the same business. Mm -hmm. So certainty. Now, again, you can't always make think, obviously it's an uncertainty, but you just need to know that that's what they're thinking. Status, certainty, then the next is autonomy. See, when we're told here in Indiana, we were told to shut down, we, our autonomy was taken away. Yeah. That puts, puts you in a threat state if you don't have choice. Next is our relatedness. What's my relationship with you as the business, if you're the CEO or the, your, your executive leader? What's my relationship with my team? Uh, is it going to be disrupted? How will we go forward? Will we be able to stay connected on Zoom uh, or Skype mm -hmm. or whatever? And finally, F stands for fair. There's just going to be a tremendous sense of what's fair. And as if you have to do some hard decisions that keep your business alive not, and, mm -hmm. and just sustainable, it could be perceived as fair. So again, you, you just need to be aware that these are the threats and name the threat, just like you said, name it, write it down, hey, and then to whatever degree you can address it, I would suggest that could be a real simple model to help remember that you want to move them towards something that once this is passed, this is where we're headed. And right now you're moving, they're experiencing threat state, they're pushing away from, and these unconsciously is what people are going through. Yeah. And I think it's it's interesting because I, th I love the model because it's a great checklist for a leader to kind of, you know, use to kind of go through and say, okay, where where is the issue? Or where, where is the biggest obstacle to bet, sort of better thinking, uh, more constructive thinking? And realizing that different members of your team may be at different stages or, or different situations, right? Some some might be more focused on the fairness aspect. Some might be more focused on the the certainty aspect. And I think one of the things I've certainly am encouraging you know my my CEO clients to do is really take some time to check in with each one of their their leadership team members and understand where are they in this because i think one of the challenges is as a CEO if you go into these situations and kind of assume that you know everyone's thinking the same way or everyone's reacting to it in the same way you're going to run you're going to run into problems or you're going to miss opportunities. And I think having that check-in process or using this model to kind of go through and really understand where each one of your team members is, is going to give you a lot more insight and probably better strategies of how you're going to deal with the situation. Yeah, they'll be more customized to the person. So here's another tip. You know, check in, pick the top three right now for you, yeah. those, the listeners, and you'll be imposing that on other people. Yeah. So that yeah. that's unconscious. So you don't want to impose. You want to just be free enough to listen deeply, listen to learn, ask to empower, listen to learn their threat, and then address it by just acknowledging that that is their concern. And whether or not you can fix it is not the issue. It's mm -hmm. at least understanding and acknowledging it and that to whatever degree you're loyal to them or have an agreement with them, that's then how you have to decide. But if you you can debrief the amygdala, the, that part of the brain, the, the, the whole experience of getting hijacked by threat, you want to debrief that. That's why my first step is seize the moment and regain focus 
and quiet the mind. And that's, that's a good way to do that. Yeah. So let me ask you, I, I get this question a lot, um, you know, from, from people in general, from, you know, some clients, uh, you know, how much should leaders be kind of exposing their own kind of feelings, vulnerabilities, concerns, and how much should they be being kind of the, the unflappable, you know, determined, you know, no emotions, just kind of go in there and like, say it like it is. I get this question a lot, like how, how vulnerable, how, how much should leaders be kind of revealing some of this stuff to their teams and how much they need to just kind of put on the, put on the facade or put on the, uh, put on the hat to lead the situation and be confident, even if inside they're, they're dealing with all these things. Yeah. Jack Stack would say, Hey, it's open book, <laughs> you know? And so there are some uh, businesses where they're, you know, everybody's involved, they have ownership and that's when it's just trans. Parent. The business owners that I work with uh, have highly confidential conversations with financial analysts that work uh, with, I do, do a lot of work with commercial real estate. So they're keeping those conversations there. Uh, they're not sugarcoating what's going on, but uh, they don't unduly create a threat. So let's say if the gentleman I talked to on Monday would have expressed all of his worry before he found out that the government was actually going to significantly reduce the threat. They went from, uh, I mean, he really notched down within three or four days. Yeah. That was only with his his business partner and the, they have, they called asset managers. Mm-hmm. I would just say, uh, just determine, will what I share be so much of a threat, undue threat, or is it something that they really do need to know and I'm not going to hide? So that's what the question is. You know, so then, but you got to work that out with uh, having a coach is yeah. vital. Yeah. I, you yeah. know, I can't do it myself even. Uh, you can't, Bruce. You know, mm-hmm. we need uh, advisors to help us because we're blind. We have a blind spot because of our own, maybe, you know, it's our own experience. Of, uh, you know, we're going through that right now for our business, yeah. right? Yeah, So absolutely. So I, I, would, that's, I hope that gave some guidelines. I, I think that makes sense. And I think it's the, the piece that I like about that. It's it's really you need to think through what what is going to help your people be in a in the right kind of mental state, you know, the the mindset to make better decisions. And, and in some cases, they're going to need the information. Like the information is going to be helpful. It's going to be part of their plan. They need to figure out a strategy for it. In other cases, if it puts them into you know a VUCA, you know, fear mode, you know, in a in a state where they're they are going to be under so much threat that they're not going to make good decisions, then then I think that gives you pause. I think you need to figure mm-hmm. out how can you talk about that, put give that information in a way that is going to keep them in a positive, creative, constructive mindset. Now, way. remind people, you just said VUCA. That means volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous. Yes, exactly. Right. Thank yeah. you. With a lot of that, turns we throw around here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So but here's another concept. It's this most senior owner, leader, executive, linger with ambiguity for a while. Yeah. Don't be so reactive that you have to decide. So think through, what is this person? What are you hearing from them before you respond? If you're working with uh, uh, employees or managers that who are really in a threat state and uh, linger with some ambiguity and don't have a quick answer, but just listen deeply, more deeply than ever before and recognize that you have a role that you can help decompress their assumptions and biases that are sending them into stories in their mind that aren't true and yeah. that you can yeah. clarify those. But it first begins by debriefing. And that often that's what I had to do with these tough minded cops and, and firefighters and this critical incident stress debriefing. They had to force them to go into it because these are tough guys, you know, mm-hmm. and, and what we would do is we'd sit around and talk. And we would debrief and just naming the emotions, no answer. But they walk away like, man, I, I, would, I didn't want to go to that meeting, but that was so good. So I would suggest that you, the, another role that a coach could have is to go into your work with your managers and just help facilitate and just have people speak and acknowledge what they're experiencing, have some clear direction from you of here's how we're handling it this week, go week by week. You should be communicating often, daily, more than likely, but someplace to debrief. So this morning, we just uh, found out there's a company called Amplify. Mm-hmm. And uh, mm-hmm. if anyone is interested, Amplify.com slash well-being, the managers can get a free assessment of their teams to actually see how the, what the experiences of engagement and what it gives just a, a good handle on understanding what's underneath the hood because people may not be sharing 
really what they're experiencing. Yeah, they, they may not be aware of it, quite honestly. I mean, I think that's the, the, you, I, I run into that situation a lot where people are in that kind of threat mode and and they don't even realize it. Right. You know? Right. You mentioned something earlier. I wanted to uh, dig in a little bit. Um, I, I came out of the lean agile software space, and and one of the kind of underlying tenets or or things that we talk about a lot in lean agile is waiting to the last responsible moment and. You mentioned this, you know, sitting with amb- ambiguity. I think it's a really key one right now because I think a lot of what happens, or one real risk that a lot of leaders face, is because of this heightened tension, because of the severity of the situation. There's this need, this this drive to make decisions, to take action. And while yes, there are certain cases and times and situations where you know time is of the essence, I think you do run into a lot of situations where you kind of overreact or at least react prematurely and being okay with sitting with uncertainty or sitting with ambiguity or sitting with not having made a decision for a little while and figuring out when do I need to make this decision? You know, finding that responsible moment. Do I need to make it today? Do I need to make it tomorrow? Does it need to be the end of the week? And giving yourself that time to let some of that stuff play out. Because I always find that time, time is a real benefit in these situations because it's going to give you, it's probably going to give you more information, right? You're going to have more information to be able to make a decision against. You're going to decompress the situation a little bit, probably open up some ideas, probably open up some communications that could actually lead to better options. And quite honestly, some things end up resolving themselves, right? With enough time, something either may get resolved or something else takes its place that you don't actually need to make the decision. So I, one of the things I, I do a lot of when we're kind of faced with these situations with teams is, well, okay, yes, there here's a decision that needs to be made. When does it need to be made? What is the last responsible moment? Or when do we run into a case where, well, if we don't make it by this point, then we then we have some issues or we have some outcomes we don't like. But do we need to make it right the second? If we don't need to make this the second, when do we need to yeah. make it? And what can we do between now and then? Yes, and uh, beautiful. Well said. I, I've worked with a lot of um, a lot of folks who just lean on lean. Yeah. And the, the idea is linger with ambiguity because yeah. also, remember, most of our best decisions are not conscious. Yeah. They come from our unconscious. So you've got to rest. You've got to sleep. You've got to sit in the swim spa. I've got one up back. You've mm-hmm. got it because sleep on it if you can. And just like you said, to the last responsible moment. Also, you know, the research is really amazing on high level professional athletes when they're in the zone, they find that there's a moment of pause and then they're faster. Mm. There's just a moment that they linger that other athletes don't and then they're they're decisive. And so it's, a, I think, a metaphor or it's physiologically a similar thing. You linger and then you're fast. One of my colleagues, uh, one of my coaching clients, but colleague as well, wrote a book, Slow Down to Grow Fast. And so it's a similar idea, slow down, yeah. yeah. That's why I call it in the moment conversations. It, let's, let's seize the moment rather than being seized by these outside forces. Then let's craft a shared vision and then let's build organizational alignment and then let's champion execution habits. That's my four step model. And I'd be glad if anybody uh, what, you know, goes online and buys the book, you show me the receipt, I'll give you a coaching session. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll put the link to the, the book on yeah. the, uh, on the yeah. show notes here so people yeah. can get it. Yeah. Immediate application because let's have the conversations before they become crucial. Yeah. You know, the, like the crucial conversations for folks, they've got that nailed. This is before you have the crucial conversations. And I think that the idea of lingering with ambiguity gives you a chance to do that observe, is it ODA, O-O-D-A, uh-huh. see, O-D-A, observe, um, orient, orient, yeah, decide, decide and action. Act. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, Anyway, just yeah. wanted to throw that in uh, to reinforce what you were saying, Bruce. No, that's great. Any other kind of um, advice, suggestions that you are giving to your to the leaders that you work with in terms of the things they really start doing, you know, in the next uh, you know days, weeks that have that have been helpful, or you know, pieces of advice that you've been giving? Yeah, I call it first thoughts, last thoughts. So the first thoughts of the day, uh, I suggest a poem by Kali Dasa, three thousand year old poem that when the sun is rising and it's just peeking over the horizon, your first thoughts are important. And Kalidasa says this, look to this day for it is life, the very life of life. In its brief course, lie all the varieties and realities of your existence, the bliss of growth, the glory of action, and the splendor of beauty. For yesterday is but a memory. Tomorrow is only a dream, but today, well lived, makes every yesterday a memory of happiness and every tomorrow a vision of hope. 
Look well, therefore, to this day, such as the salutation to the dawn. So the concept is wake up to your whatever spiritual direction you have inside of you. And then last thoughts at night, the you know, tremendous uh, practice of, of, of counting it a happy privilege that you face these troubles yeah. and that there's so many, so many things to, to be thankful for. And then go to sleep, have really great ideas generated from your huge unconscious mind and wake up with some new insights. Yeah, very, very stoic. Very I'm, a, I'm a big uh, sort of stoic philosopher guy. And I think that right. it's very much in line of, you know, see, seize yeah. the day, do what you can, focus on the things you yeah. control. You know, don't yeah. don't worry about the things you can't. Uh, live a good life, you know, kind of, you know, and I think, yeah. I, you know, unfortunately, times like this is when this stuff really starts to, you know, apply. And, you know, it's it's kind of the test of our test of our focus. And, yeah. And thanks really, for your work, man. You know, you're digging in good, uh, good work. And I'll, I'll blast this out to my email list and all that. And so thank you. Uh, appreciate yeah. all that you're doing as well. No, I thank you, Craig. I appreciate it. And thanks for spending some time with me today. All right. Take care. You've been listening to Scaling Up Services with business coach Bruce Eckfeldt. To find a full list of podcast episodes, download the tools and worksheets, and access other great content, visit the website at scalingupservices.com. And don't forget to sign up for the free newsletter at scalingupservices.com slash newsletter.